Happy Sabbath and God King. And happy anniversary. I'd like to thank the pastor for the opportunity to speak today. I volunteered actually to do this sermon. I wasn't on the schedule, but the Lord has laid a burden on me this year. And I decided that this would be a great opportunity to work towards the fulfillment of the burden that he has placed on me. I'd like to give special thanks to my wife, who is my editor-in-chief, as I say. And she is in charge of ensuring that I do not delay the next phase of the church fellowship, which is downstairs, for those who are hungry. But on a more serious note, the truth is that if you do not have the spiritual hunger that needs to be filled when you come to church, you have some praise. See, the stuff you're going to have downstairs, your body will discard it in a couple of days. But the things that we will be enjoying and discussing and listening to it up here are the things that are going to last. And so, uh, I will begin with prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the message that you have given me. And I pray that you would take over now. Open the hearts of the hearers and of the Holy Spirit work today. Let nobody's attention be elsewhere, but let it be stayed on you. As I give your message to Christ. Amen. Today is a high day. It's not an ordinary Sabbath day. It's an anniversary day. And what's so special about anniversaries? Well, let's think about wedding anniversaries. The wedding anniversary harkens back to that special time. How many of you are married? Quite a few members are married. Special time, that first love, the first blush, sweet and fresh. Everything in the world just seemed okay. Everything was right. We didn't have money yet, most of us. We didn't have the property. But it didn't matter because you were in love. You found that person that you could bond with for life. And in the ideal situation, in the ideal situation, this rose bud, this new love, would not remain a bud forever. Over the years, that bud would open and the petals would begin to mature, and the fullness of the beauty of the flower would take place, but it takes time for that to develop. And that love matures and evolves not because of emotion. No, many of the really intense emotions tend to die down over time, but it is that maturity that comes with experience of going through tough times with somebody else and working to goals or a single goal with the other person as you meet the challenges of life. And then every year, around the same time, which we call the anniversary, that couple looks at those Ebenezer's that they have erected, those milestones that say, look at what we have accomplished. And these landmarks mark the times that you have spent with the other person, because they're things that you are going to accomplish in that marriage. Maybe it's about raising kids. Maybe it's about seeing them go through grade school, getting towards the different graduations. Maybe it's about getting that dream home and expanding on it, getting along in your career. And every year, at the same time, you celebrate that anniversary. And if you're going according to God's ideal, well, that marriage would be looking like this, a triangle. And in that triangle, the third point of the triangle is not the in-laws, it's God. And as the Bible text shows in 1 John 1, 17, where if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we walk one with another. Well, as you, the husband and the wife, move towards God, guess what? You move towards each other at the same time. And that is God's ideal in the marriage. Unfortunately, we, mankind, have found ways to twist and contort these relationships 
so that they have nothing of the loving splendor that God intended. And so, over time, as these anniversaries passed, for some people, they don't mean as much anymore. And some of that gentleness and kindness seems to evaporate with each sunset. Some people are only clinging to each other because of the kids. Others, because of the financial situation that they're in. No more holding over the, holding open the door. Gently leading somebody down the steps so that they don't slip. Holding a heavy bag or even holding the hand. Things that we used to do during courtship that we were glad to do. What happens after all those years? Do the anniversaries mean anything after a time? There's a song that is secular that says, Where is the love? Where is the love you said was mine, all mine, to the end of time? It wasn't just a line. Where is the love? Yeah. Well, the couple sometimes gets to a point where they can't see the future anymore. And they don't want to see a future anymore because it's not rosy. It's tarnished. It's ugly. Sometimes friends become themes. Sometimes relationships become sinking ships. They have no more vision of the future because they can't see beyond the turmoil of the present. What does an anniversary mean then? Well, let's look at the church. Agape. What does an anniversary mean to a church like Agape? We have come a long way, Agape. I wasn't here at the beginning. I'm one of the many that joined along that path. No longer in a basement. No longer worshiping in a house. We have expanded. We have moved on. Our children are becoming leaders. Our ministerial associates have become ordained ministers. We have budding talents. We have musicians amongst the young people. We have double-digit numbers of pathfinders and of adventurers. We have the capacity to have potluck every week. We have outings, we have picnics, we have health fairs, and now we're in the mainstream media. We have come a long way, Agape. Oh, how we have grown. But as we come to our 19th anniversary, there is something that is disturbing. We face a crisis, a crisis of potential stagnation which some of you might have heard over the last two to three weeks. I want to start this program for the children, but we have pathfinding drills we want to do, but we want to have a week of prayer every week. I mean, I have a week of prayer where we meet every day during the week, but we need more time and space for the choir to practice, but for us to flourish, Agape, for us to meet the next anniversary and really show that we have grown, there is something that we need. For us to change and evolve in our personal lives as well as in our church life, there is something special that we need. And that is what I want to talk to you about in my sermon, which is called Myopia. Myopia. Our scripture reading is found in 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash the king of Israel came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thy hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot! And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou hast consumed them. And he said, Take the arrow. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. 
Then hast thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Myopia. I was about 17 years old when it first happened to me. I was observing something from a distance when somebody drew my attention and said, Larry, why are you squinting? Squinting? I didn't know I was squinting. I didn't know why I was squinting. But pretty soon my mother noticed that I was squinting too. And she said, you know what, I'm going to take you to the eye doctor. And so off to the doctor we went. My mother told the doctor the story, and he took me into a room, told me, put one hand over your eyes, and read these letters. And I thought, well, that's easy enough. E F P T O Z L P um see that one. Oh, said the doctor, come over here. And so he took me to this machine with a bunch of little glasses inside of them. And he started shifting the glasses one after the other and said, Can you see now? What do you see now? After a while, he popped one glass in particular and asked, I was shocked, for all of a sudden. He said, oh my goodness. The F P T O Z L P E D and so on and so forth. And the doctor just looked at my mom knowingly and said, Well, your son has a mild case of myopia. I will give you a prescription for his glasses. So we went off to the glasses store and bought glasses, and what glasses they were, big and square, covering half of my face, and in retrospect, it was the main reason I couldn't get a girlfriend in college. <laughs> myopia. But I'm thinking to myself, myopia, what in the world is that? Well, being a curious youngster, loving science, I decided to look it up. Myopia better known as short-sightedness, a condition where the eyeball is elongated and the cornea and the lens focus the image in front of the retina so that what you're looking at from a distance appears blurred. To correct the condition of myopia, you have to understand how the eye works. And so, for you to see something, light from whatever you're looking at has to go through the eye and then the cornea, which is the front of the eye, and the lens, which is right behind it, bends the light so that it forms an image on the back of your eye. And then your brain interprets that image, and that's how you see it. Well, when you have myopia, the eyeball is elongated, it's long, and so the image cannot be bent to fit on the back of your eye. It actually forms in front of the back of your eye, and so what you see looks blurred. In order to correct myopia, you have to wear special corrective lenses. We call them glasses. And what the glasses do is to bend the light out a little bit so that when it's bent by your eyes, it falls in the right place. Myopia. The problem with myopia is that you can see clearly the things that are right in front of you. But as they move out to a distance, they become blurred. They become unclear. You become uncertain about what you're seeing, and it can become a real problem. In a physical sense, myopia can be actually very dangerous. Imagine that you're driving down the road on your country day, the sun is out at 75 degrees, and you're enjoying your road, your drive. And you're coming around the corner, and all of a sudden you see this. Well, the sign, I, I'm not quite sure what that sign is. Oh, I. Can't tell. And you continue pressing the accelerator when all of a sudden you run into this. You see, myopia, if uncorrected, can present a catastrophe. Once while I was in training as a resident, I got into a conversation with a young nutritionist at the hospital. She was single and considered by many to be attractive. And so I, after I finished my duties one day, I got into this conversation with her. And she must have thought that maybe I was flirting with her. And in the course of the conversation, all of a sudden, she shot a question to me, so what is your five-year plan? My, my what? My, my five-year plan? I thought to myself, and I started to stutter and fumble with my words. I was just simply outgunned here. In my busy resident life, I was barely thinking about the next weekend. And here I'm talking to this woman who's asking me, what is my five-year plan? 
A couple of years later, I heard she got married. And I couldn't help but wonder when I heard that, what that new husband had answered when she asked him the question. <laughs> well, I soon found out that she wasn't uncommon. In fact, the women of her age group and our age group were thinking all the same way. And indeed, it was an embarrassing situation for me, but it was a learning experience. You see, she was far-sighted. I was myopic. I was short-sighted. I had myopia. She was thinking far ahead. And she was accomplishing her goals because she saw far ahead and she envisioned how she was going to get there. Well, if myopia ended in the social fair, that would be bad enough. But unfortunately, myopia extends even into spirituality and into Christendom. You see, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, that where there is no vision, the people perish. God has a vision for every single one of us, a grand design for our lives. But the problem is that we can't see beyond our own vision to see what God has in plan for us. We cannot pierce that darkness, that cloud, that shroud that we cover ourselves with in our short-sightedness. God has a vision for us that transcends everything that is physical, but we are stuck in the physical. There is no wonder that the Apostle Paul, when he was giving his ranking of spiritual gifts in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, said that the number one gift you can have is Apostle. Well, that's why we're here. We're here to evangelize the world so that they can be ready for Jesus when Jesus comes. But what's the second gift? Prophecy. Prophecy, the gift of far-sightedness. There's no wonder then that for a church to grow, after you've got the apostles and people are starting to come, and the very next thing you need are far-sighted people for the church to grow. Isn't that amazing? Without a vision, the people perish. Well, many of us have come to this country from other places. And we had wonderful and great visions of what we wanted to do and what we wanted to accomplish. In fact, there was a comedian who made a joke about it and said, well, you know, when I was in Mexico, I used to dream about coming to the United States because I was told that its roads were made of gold. But when I got here, I found out that the roads weren't made of gold. In fact, they were full of potholes. And not only were they full of potholes, but they expected me to fix them. And so we come with the American dream and for the American dream. And we have a hard time here in the country. And then the American dream turns into a nightmare and our vision goes no further than our next paycheck. And we begin to suffer from myopia. And we start seeing the physical when God really wants us to see the supernatural. And we see the temporal when God really wants us to see the eternal. And we see the ordinary when God wants us to see the extraordinary. And so God tries to teach us his divine plan and give us his vision. But we tend to become like Abraham. You see, God told Abraham, go to a land that I'm going to show you. And when you get there, I'm going to make your seed multiply like the stars of heaven. Now, young Abraham, probably in his 30s, nice young wife, he figured, up, well, yeah, land, got a nice young wife, no problem. I can see that vision coming true. But after some time, after decades had passed by, when the wrinkles started to appear like the waves of the sea, when arthritis started to set in, when Sarah starts looking at the promise and says, well, my last hot flash was about 40 years ago. And as far as Abraham was concerned, well, we have a mixed age audience, so I'm not going to talk about what medications weren't invented yet. God, it's just not happening. God, are you sure that this is the way that you wanted your promise to come true? We have a better solution. Hey, God, where are you? And so Abraham's vision leads to heartache, which in hindsight was best avoided. But God refused to leave Abraham with myopia. God is not going to allow the Christian to stay in their myopic state. God wants to cure you of your myopia. And so, 
Abraham had to go and have an eye exam. <laughs> One day, after God had fulfilled that promise, and he got that promise and cherished son, God said to Abraham, take that son, thy only son. You see, Abraham was so myopic that sometimes God was afraid he would be looking no further than Ishmael. Take thy son, thy only son, Isaac, just to be sure, whom thou lovest, and get to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And so, he packs up his stuff in obedience, takes Isaac, and they head up to the mountain. Isaac was not a dunce. In Trinidad, we say a tribute. He wasn't stupid. They're walking along that mountain trail, and he's going through his mental checklist, his itinerary. It's like, Camping supplies, check. Wood, check. Knife, check. Rope to tie up, check. Rocks in the distance for an altar, check. Sheep, sheep, sheep. Dad, where is the sheep? Time for the eye test. And Abraham said to his son, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Myopia cured. And that is where God wants each and every one of us to get to. God has a cure for our myopia. Just as we have a physical cure for myopia we call glasses, God has a cure for our spiritual myopia, and he calls it faith. Hebrews 1.11 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't taste it. It is somewhere out there. That is what faith is. Spiritual glasses. And the people who overcame and became giants in the, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, people who demonstrated this faith. Noah being warned of God, of things not yet seen, moved with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Things not as yet seen. In fact, in his day, all the physicists and the geologists and the environmentalists and the meteorologists all came to know and said, Rain? What's that? Rain? Well, while they were asking about rain, they all died in the rain. But Noah had on the glasses that he could see beyond what human beings could see. Moses was no different. The Bible says he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. What does invisible mean? Something you can't see. So how was he seeing something that was invisible? He had special glasses. And this behavior marks all the people in the Bible who are able to triumph. In fact, Hebrews says that these, all these people died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them far off. It is a lack of faith that allows us to have spiritual myopia. But God says in this word that those people who are going to be his people, who he's going to take back with him to heaven, are going to have one characteristic. It said, For there it is righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. But even God, even Christ's disciples, suffered from myopia. In fact, there was a time when they were walking around and the Lord had, in one of his sort of cryptic messages, said to them, Beware of the love of the Pharisees. They said, well, Beware of the love of the what is the Lord talking about? Oh, he didn't bring enough bread. That must be the problem. And the Lord gets annoyed with them because he had already fed 5,000 people. And he had already fed 4,000 people with a couple loaves and fishes. And they're thinking about, we didn't bring enough bread. They were short-sighted. They could only see what was in their hands. They couldn't see beyond in spite of all the things that God had done for them. So he decided to teach them a lesson. And so... They came to this place where he was going to teach them a lesson. He said to them, Why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet. What is to perceive? To see. 
Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye a heart, have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? Short-sighted, myopic. Well, he said, when I break five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took me up? And he said, I was in twelve. In other words, God didn't just meet the need, he goes beyond the need. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And he said, seven. And he said, I said, how is it that you do not understand? The God begins, how is it that we don't understand? How many times has God fed you, taken care of you, fulfilled your needs in all of these years as we've come up to the 19 years that you've been here or been in this country? How is it that when the next issue comes up, we somehow can't seem to remember? Well, they came to a place called Bethesda. And there was there a blind man. And the blind man had a problem. He had physical blindness. But he wanted to see. And so he came to the master ophthalmologist. And he asked Jesus, I want to see. And Jesus took mud and put it on the man's eyes. And he said, what do you see? And he said, I see men like trees walking. And then the Lord put some more on his eyes, and all of a sudden he said, well, what can you see now? He said, I can see clearly. Did Jesus fail? What was the problem here? He could, he could heal the man according as his measure of faith was exhibited. And because he didn't exhibit total faith, he could only be healed by so much. And that was the problem that the disciples were having. They could only exhibit but so much faith, but they couldn't see beyond the difficulties. They suffered from myopia. Well, unfortunately, many of us who suffer from myopia bring it into the church, and we infect other people with it, and we all become short-sighted and start tripping over each other. It happened thousands of years ago in the church. The church needed to expand. It needed to get out of the rental property. It needed to grow. It needed to acquire more room. And so the church sent out a committee to spy out the land. And the committee did its job and went for some months and they spied out the land and they came back to the church leader with a report. And the leader said, is it true what I heard in the real estate report? And they said to him, we came into the land with us and to us, and surely it flowed with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. And if it had stopped there, it would have been perfect. But, but, they said, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Pastor taught the Sabbath school lesson this morning, and he talked about what? Projection. Putting on to other people what's going on in you. He said, they said, in our sight, we were like grasshoppers, and we were like that in their sight too. Projection. Myopia. But not everybody suffers from myopia. Some people have hypermetropia. Multiple. Hypermetropia. Caleb said, and Caleb still the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Far sighted vision. Don't look at the difficulties in front of you. See beyond the difficulties. See what God can accomplish in you and through you if you put your hands in His. Hypermetropia believes that the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither that his ear is heavy, that it cannot hear. Hypermetropia believes that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. The Bible teaches that in the last days, the church of the last days, Laodicea, suffers from myopia. He says, because you say I'm rich, Increased in goods, have need of nothing. You know it's not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor well. Blind and naked. And what is God's treatment? He says, to go and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. 
Blindness is a problem that the church is facing. Myopia is a problem that keeps us back. So when are we going to put on the spiritual faith glasses? What are we waiting for? Egypt is going down in flames. Moscow is getting bombed. Policemen are getting shot. Everywhere around us, it is clear that the world is not going to last very long into the future. And we know by prophecy that when the prophecy is fulfilled, they're going to come after us. Is that when you're going to try to put on your spiritual glasses? When somebody comes knocking on your door in a blue uniform with handcuffs on the side? Is that when you're going to try to put on the faith glasses? You have to start putting on the faith glasses now. The Bible says in Luke chapter 21, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations and perplexity, the sea of the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, because what? They're looking on what? The things that are coming on the earth. They're seeing what's going on around them, in their neighborhoods, in their schools, in their workplace, and they're looking and they're scared. And then some of them come to you in your workplace and say, oh my goodness, what's going on here? The stock market is crashing. I'm about to lose my job. What's going on? And, and what is our response? Okay, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> Myopia. They're coming to us because they think we can see something better. And what do we tell them? We have the same problem that they have. We're both going to the eyeglasses shop together. The Bible teaches this. When you see these things happen, where do you look? Oh, because your redemption draws nigh. Can you see the redemption there in the clouds? No. You have to be able to see beyond the clouds to what God is bringing to us. Farsightedness. Hypermetropia. And we have to start practicing it now. If we can't do it now, we are not going to do it when times get really tough. Yeah. As Pastor said in his sermon last week, if you can't walk with the horsemen, I'll leave them content with the horses. When your back is against the wall and your job is on the line and it doesn't look like the next check is going to come and the bills are overwhelming you and the credit card company is calling you and your credit score is going down, when it looks like you have diseases that are probably incurable, but it looks like we can't find the church. Then we have to have hypermetropia. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Well, the prophet Elisha was a man of far-sighted vision. And all his life, he was like that. People would come to him with crises. Oh my goodness, the pottage is poisoned. And some of us ate it literally. And there's no activated charcoal. What are we going to do? Or just shrug a little wash it, a little salt inside of there. I borrowed this axe head, and it was expensive. It was from Home Depot. And the axe head fell in the water and sank to the bottom. How am I going to get it back? Or oh, don't worry. I'll just drop a branch again, and the axe head will come to the surface. All his life. Calm. Let proceed. My toe is falling off. I don't know what to do. My wife doesn't want to see me anymore. Look at the river seven times. Far-sighted vision. Not phased. Not worried. And there came a time when his city was surrounded. Surrounded by the armies of the Syrians, their arch enemy at the time. And his servant was thinking, oh my goodness, look at how many people there are out there. We don't even have a tenth of their arm. They are coming for us. We don't even have enough water in the house. And Elisha wasn't perturbed. And his servant's like, what, what's wrong? Can you see these people outside there? And Elisha just went and prayed to the Lord and said, open his eyes so that he could see what I see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the servant and he saw chariots of fire surrounding them in the mountains. They were protected. But Elisha could see it. But the servant couldn't. Myopia. Well, this level of spiritual aptitude and progress has to characterize us Christians at the end of time. Because the people outside are looking at us 
And we have to go to them and open their eyes. Because God is opening our eyes by faith. And now we have to go to them and open their eyes, the scripture says, to deliver them. So open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance just like us. Well, Elisha's life had come to an end. And he was on his deathbed. Time had run out on a great and mighty prophet. And he was going to go the way of mankind. And the young king was scared. His insurance policy was about to die. And the enemies were still there. And he knew something was going wrong. When he said the chariots of the Lord, he was reminding Elijah of the time when Elijah left him. And he was worried. What's going to happen to the kingdom when this prophet dies? And the prophet, with the last bit of strength in him, said, Take your bow and arrow, and let's shoot out the enemy. He shot out the window and he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance from Syria. And then he says, take the arrows and strike them on the ground. And he strikes only three times. Myopia. Can't see beyond. He could have had the victory right there. Consume his enemies. But he could only see three times. Agape Church. Each of us as members has mountains to climb. Are you going to be looking at the jagged edges of the rocks that you have to go over? Are you going to be looking at the precipices in between the slopes that you have to bridge? Is that how far your vision can see? Forgetting that it is God in Isaiah chapter 40 who said, oh, you don't even have to walk up the hill. I can help you mount up the wings like eagles and let you soar to the top of the hill if you would let me. Hypermetropia. Do you have a faith problem? You've got glasses on. You've been in the church for a while. You have glasses on, but they're the wrong prescription. You need a stronger prescription. But you don't know how to get that stronger prescription. Well, somebody else had that problem. Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and down at the bottom he found his disciples trying to get this demon out of this little child and the father is frantic because the disciples can't do it and the disciples are frantic because they got everybody else to come out but now they can't tackle this problem. And Jesus says, do you want your child to be here? Do you believe I can do it? Says, yes, Lord, I believe you can do it but I'm not 100% sure. He said, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Amen. If you're lacking the glasses, God will give you the glasses that you need. So as a church, filled with people, some of whom have myopia, are we going to overcome as a church and have our vision healed? Or are we going to be like the Israelites of old? who thought that they were grasshoppers, and so as a result died like grasshoppers. I believe by God's grace that this is going to be the last anniversary we're going to spend in this church. Amen. I believe by God's grace that we will celebrate a wonderful and grand 20th anniversary with all the bells and whistles in our new church. Amen. But that will only happen if we get out of the grasshopper syndrome and see ourselves as God sees us and see our opportunities as he wants us to see them and become far-sighted in the process. You see, where the parents failed, the children didn't stumble. We as parents don't want our time to pass. And these kids have to do it. Well, it happened in the past church too. You see, they got to it. They learned the lessons that their parents failed to do. And God said, we will conquer this land, but there was a river in front of them. And there was no boat to carry a thousand people. There was no ferry of the Essequibo. They had to go across that river. 
And there was no evidence there of what was hoped for to allow them to cross that river. And God didn't let the river open when they reached to that last sand grain before stepping in. They had to walk into the water before the miracle happened. God is not going to just lay our blessings in our hands. We have to step into the water. They did it because they walked by faith and not by sight. By faith and not by sight. They don't see the pink slip. They don't see the low bank account. They don't see the interest rate going up on the credit. They don't see the past failures. They don't see the old broken relationships. They don't see that I can't find a partner and I'm getting older. They don't see I can't have kids after trying. They don't see that this disease is incurable and going to finish me off. They don't walk by sight. They walk by faith. The just shall live by faith. And if we are going to overcome and walk into the kingdom, we have to be a faith-driven people. And we have to put that faith into practice. Like a muscle in the gym. And that faith will grow and grow as the mustard seed. How many of us today are suffering from myopia? How many of us see that challenge and we back off? I can't deal with that. That's too big for me. You told me that you won't give me something that I can't handle. But he gave it to you so at least you can handle it. How many of us are struggling to see beyond what is in front of our eyes? How many of us want to have those faith glasses so we can see like Elisha's song and not be perturbed? If you want to have faith vision, I'm not talking about cable vision now. I'm talking about faith vision. If you want to have faith vision, if you want to have an extraordinary life and expect extraordinary things from the God who does extraordinary things for his people, then I invite you to come up front and prepare. the end of the prayer, we're going to take a text from the Bible and we're going to claim it by faith. disciples in the New Testament, we have a measure of unbelief deep down inside of us that causes us not to trust you completely. We still have our reserves. 
We still depend on the securities that surround our living and our life here in the Big Apple. But dear God, today you're calling us to cast all of our cares upon you. You want to do big things for us personally, and you want to do big things for us as a church. But our faith is not where it's supposed to be. Lord, the gift of faith is also a fruit of the Spirit. And it's important for us to be people of faith because you said the just shall live by faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So today, dear God, we cry out to you and we say, Come by, Lord. Come by us. Come and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Come and fill us with your vision. Take the eye, the scales from off our eyes. And let us see clearly the way you want us to see. Give us heavenly vision. Give us eyes of faith. And not eyes of fear. I believe, dear God, as the preacher said, that next anniversary, we will be worshiping in our own church. We do not know yet what that church is or where it is, but we know, dear God, as we call upon you after 20 years, you are going to bless us in a mighty way. So today, oh God, I pray that each one of us, members and guests and every one of our leaders, and we will not just be spectators to see what would the pastor or the leaders do, how will they achieve this, but we will get involved. We will participate. We will put our bits and pieces and our all into it and see this vision come true. We thank you, Lord, in advance. We praise your holy name. We give you glory and honor. Let the church say, Amen. 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 Father, we pray for individual lives too. We need your blessings. We need your power. And we need your close walk with us daily as we go through life. Help us, Lord, never to let you go. We know that you will never let us go. So we come into our lives and we thank you for making some breakthroughs in our family lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don't let you have to go. I want, we're going to do a little exercise. Because the only way that we will overcome is by claiming the promises of the Lord. And so I'll have Pastor come down and he's going to stretch his arms over the congregation. I want everybody in the congregation to raise your hand towards the Lord. And we're going to do a text that's in the Bible. The prayer of the man who was blind. And you'll read the congregation part. What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? Lord, Jesus said, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath healed thee. 